Hi. Uh, for us, it's a pleasure to have the Professor Julia Chusoy from Toyota Technology Institute of Chicago as our next speaker. Uh, the, her work focuses mainly on optimization problem, on graph, and approximation algorithms. And Julia has published a lot of paper in the main journals of, and congress of the area. Uh, the title of the today's talk is Toward Toward Better Algorithms for Graphs Crossing Number. Uh, thank you very much, Julia, for accepting the invitation. Yeah, thank you so much. It's too bad we can't be in Buenos Aires right now. Uh, so the talk title is Towards Better Approximation of Graph Crossing Number, and it's partially based on joint work with Epidema Abadi and Zian Tan. So I'm going right away, go into the problem definition. So the problem is called graph crossing number. So the input of this problem is a graph G. And throughout this whole talk, the number of vertices in this graph is going to be denoted by N. And what we need to do is to draw this graph in the plane while minimizing the number of crossings. So what does it mean to draw a graph in the plane? So this is what you would intuitively think it is. So you need to draw every vertex as a point in a plane. And now every edge, it becomes a simple curve that connects its endpoints. And there are some restrictions. For example, you do not allow for an image of an edge to go through a vertex like this, unless this vertex is the endpoint of this edge. So this is forbidden. And also you do not allow for three edges to meet at the same point like this, unless again, this is a common endpoint of all these edges. So this is also forbidden. So for example, we could have a drawing that looks like this. This is a good drawing of a graph. So in such a drawing, whenever we have images of two edges meet, like here, and this meeting point is not their end point, then we call it a crossing. So for example, here in this image, we have three crossings. And so we say that the solution value, which is the number of crossings, is three in this case. And we want to find a drawing whose solution value is the smallest possible, or it has fewest possible number of crossings. So also throughout this talk, I will denote by opt the value of the optimal solution, also known as the crossing number of your graph. And it's also the smallest number of crossings that you have to incur in order to draw this graph in the plane. So this problem, it really has a crazy history. It was introduced by Paul Turan during World War II. And in fact, he was working in forced labor at the brick factory. And he came up with a problem as a way to get around some logistical issues that they had there. But this turned out to be a really important problem that has connections to a lot of areas. And in fact, there is a whole area of computer science called graph drawing, where all this study is basically variants of this problem. And this problem was also studied a lot in graph theory and graph crossing number is important graph parameter. And one can explore connections between graph crossing number and other graph parameters. The pr problem also comes up a lot in graph algorithms and also in some applications such as graph visualization, VLSI design, and so on. And as such, this problem has been studied really a lot. And in fact, there is an online bibliography that someone maintains, and it has more than 700 papers on this topic, and it's not even up to date. And despite all this, the problem is still really poorly understood. So it was studied from all of these different angles. And in today's talk, I'm going to focus on one such angle, and it's more like computer science algorithmic angle, where we want to design efficient algorithm that given a graph finds its drawing with few crossings. And now I said efficient algorithm, what do we mean by that? And this is a standard theoretical definition of what efficient algorithm is. So it's running time should be bounded by a polynomial function in the input sites. In our case, n here is the number of vertices, so running time should be bounded by polynomial function in number of vertices. So this algorithm, it will receive input, it will do some calculations, and then it needs to produce output, which is the drawing of the graph. And with this problem, it's not even clear that you can do that because you need to somehow represent a drawing of a graph efficiently. Is it even possible to do this? So I'm going to quickly go into this and I'm going to start with planar graphs. So planar graphs are important, and these are graphs that can be drawn with no crossings. So the crossing number or opt for planar graphs is zero. This, for example, is a planar graph. How can I represent this drawing of this planar graph? For example, I can list all faces in this drawing, and for every face, I can list the sequence of vertices and edges on the boundary of the face as we encounter them as we traverse the boundary. 
So um, given this, you can reconstruct this drawing of the graph efficiently and easily. And in fact, if you have two drawings for which this list are the same, we'll consider them as the same drawing. So this is planar graphs. Now what happens with general graphs? So let me take any graph G, it's not planar. Maybe this is the drawing. How can we represent this drawing efficiently? So here's a little trick that we can do. Let's put on every crossing, we're going to put a vertex. It will look like that. And so now I got the planar graph, I'm going to call it H, and we know how to represent a drawing of planar graph efficiently, so we are done. So in order to define a drawing of a general graph G, it's enough to list the corresponding planar graph H, the drawing of H, and for each edge of H, which edge of G does it represent? So at least if we were worried about this, can you even represent the output efficiently? We can, this is not a problem. Now to the bad news, and the bad news is that the problem is NP-hard, even when every vertex is degree three. And this means that most likely the problem does not have any efficient algorithms. And at this point you can say, okay, this is it, the problem is closed, it doesn't have efficient algorithms, we are done. But that's not very satisfying because we do need to solve this problem in practice. And it's a really important problem. We want to be able to say something good about it, algorithmically something useful. So the next thing that we can do, we can say, okay, let's design efficient algorithms. And maybe they will not solve the problem exactly, but they will produce reasonably good solutions. So here we can ask, what do you mean by reasonably good solution? How do we define a reasonably good solution? And we can say, well, if the number of crossings is small, let's say at most five or at most 5,000, that's a good solution. But this definition is also not so good because you have some graphs in which the crossing number is small and some graphs in which the crossing number is big. And so using this one definition for all graphs is really not good. So this definition, it has to depend on your input graph. And actually you should be comparing yourself to the crossing number of the graph. So this brings us to the notion of approximation factor. So if I have an algorithm, its approximation factor is the ratio in the number of crossings in the solution to the optimum or the crossing number of the graph. And we take the worst case possible ratio over all possible graphs. We take the worst one and that's the approximation factor of the algorithm. So in other words, a factor alpha approximation algorithm, it's efficient algorithm and given any input graph G, it has to compute its drawing in which the number of crossings is at most alpha times the crossing number of G. And this alpha, we call it approximation factor of the algorithm. And in the area of approximation algorithms, there's area like that in computer science, it's all about these approximation factors. So we use these approximation factors in order to measure how good our algorithm is. And generally the closer this factor is to one, the better the algorithm. And this factor is always at least one. So ideally we want to get the approximation factor that is constant, that looks like factor two approximation or factor three approximation. And of course we want a good constant, but constant approximation is good generally, but it's not always attainable. And sometimes you have to do with approximation factors that are function of N, generally the input size, in our case, the number of vertices. And so here the intuition is that as long as this function is slowly growing function of n, let's say at most polylogarithmic, it's sort of okay. And by the way, throughout this talk, when I say polylog n, what I mean is functions that look like this, log n, log squared n, some power of log n, I'm just not gonna tell you which power. So generally these approximation factors are still large, but are still fine. But as the approximation factors become bigger and bigger, it becomes more and more problematic. And by the time we get to approximation factors that are polynomial in N, this is really bad. This is like saying, you know, there is nothing I can do about this problem. And again, in this talk, when I say polynomial in N, usually we use also include also functions that look like this, square root N and to the one quarter and so on. So typically you want to design algorithms that have good approximation factors. So going back to the crossing number problem, what we want is an approximation algorithm that has a good approximation factor because the problem is NP hard. That's the next best thing that we can do. So before we go into approximation algorithms, we need to ask what happens if the crossing number of your graph is zero. So I already, already mentioned these graphs, these are called planar graphs. They are really important graphs and they have been studied a lot. And there are efficient algorithms that will recognize if your graph is planar. And if so, it will find a planar drawing of this graph. So a planar drawing is just a drawing with no crossings. Now, just as an exercise, let's take it a step further. Let's take a planar graph and add one edge to it. So I'm going to call these near planar graphs. 
what happens then? So first of all, what can we say about the crossing number of this graph? Is it small? Is it big? So it turns out it can be as big as almost square root n. For example, if I take this root n by root n grid, I add an edge that connects two vertices that are far enough from each other, and I get a graph whose crossing number is omega of square root n. OK, what about algorithms? So if the maximum vertex degree in the graph is constant, uh, then for these near planar graphs, there is a constant factor approximation algorithm, which is good. But we don't even know if this problem is NP hard for near planar graphs. And if we don't make any assumptions on maximum vertex degree, we actually don't have any algorithms. So it's really crazy that even the simple special case where we take planar graph plus one edge, we really don't understand it well. So before I continue talking about uh, approximation algorithms for the problem, I'm going to take a little detour and I want to talk about some basic facts about planar graphs and crossing number. And I'm going to start with vertex connectivity, which is a standard graph theoretic definition. So we said that the graph is K connected. If whenever I delete any set of K minus one vertices from it, it remains connected. An important example that we are going to use a lot is three connectivity. So this graph is three connected. How do I know? Whenever I delete any two vertices from this graph, like these two vertices, I delete them, I get a connected graph. So this graph is three connected. And why is three connectivity important? Because there is this theorem that if your graph is planar and three connected, it only has one planar drawing. So it's again drawing with no crossings. Okay, and what happens if your graph is planar and not three connected? For example, this graph. Well, then you can get many different planet drawings. For example, this is another planet drawing of the same graph. And one more thing I want to mention is crossing number inequality. It's a really important inequality that basically says that if you get a lot of edges, your crossing number is going to be big. So here M is the number of edges. And it says if the number of edges is at least 7M, then the crossing number is at least M cubed by N squared. So crossing number grows really fast with number of edges. And if, for example, we take a complete graph, so it has n squared edges, then its crossing number is omega of n to the four, and this is the biggest we can get. So this finishes the detour, and now I'm going back to approximation algorithm for the crossing number problem. And the thing is, there is not much to say because we don't have any approximation algorithms for this problem. So instead, we're going to look at bounded degree graphs, but not quite. So what will actually happen is that whenever I say alpha approximation algorithm, what I actually mean, the approximation factor is alpha times some polynomial in delta. Delta is the maximum vertex degree. So it's like maybe alpha times delta squared or alpha times delta to the 10. I'm just not going to tell you what is the power of the polynomial. So in a sense, we are looking at low degree graphs. And one can ask, well, why is it interesting to look at low degree graphs? So there are two reasons. The first one, let's go back to the crossing number inequality. What does it tell us? Intuitively, it tells us if you want the crossing number to be reasonable, then average vertex degree has to be small. This is not the same as maximum vertex degree to be small, but it motivates looking into low degree graphs. And second, the problem is so poorly understood that you have to start somewhere, and low degree graphs is a very reasonable and good family to start from. So from now on, for the rest of this talk, I'm going to ignore the dependence of the approximation factor on the maximum degree. It's going to be polynomial dependence. Or if you prefer, you can assume that maximum vertex degree is bounded by constant. So now we can talk about non-algorithms for this graph crossing number problem and for positive results. So the first algorithm was this famous paper of Leighton and Rao. The paper actually focused on sparse cut problem, but it also gave this algorithm for crossing number. And it says that you can draw any graph and the number of crossings is going to be n times the crossing number of the graph times log to the fourth n. So again, this is for bounded degree graphs only, and I'm not going to mention this bounded degree graph anymore. So if we look at this from the approximation algorithms perspective, what approximation it gives us, it's n log to the fourth n approximation. Because if a crossing number is pretty small, you may end up with as many as n log to the fourth n crossings. But as the crossing number of the graph becomes larger, this gives better and better approximation. So in a sense, this result sort of resolves the problem when the crossing number is very big. But really, the interesting case is when the crossing number is quite small, because this is when you have a chance to get good drawings. So this result was subsequently improved a little bit. So these log factors, they got shaved. And at this point, 
we only had n polylog n approximation algorithms. And this is really unusual. So usually in the area of approximation algorithms, if you want to get a factor and approximation algorithm, it's always easy. Actually, I don't know of any other problem in which getting factor and approximation is hard. Usually, no matter what you do, it's an approximation. Uh, going below n is harder. But in this problem, even getting an approximation seems to be difficult. So these were these positive results. And now we can say, OK, maybe this problem is very difficult, and no good approximation algorithms exist for it. And the thing is, we don't really know. We only have this negative result. I won't go into it, but I'll just say it doesn't even rule out factor two approximation. So this is as big a gap as you can get between positive and negative results. So these positive results, they were actually improved a little bit. So in the sequence of papers, we improved it to n to the 0.9 approximation. And the recent sequence of papers by Kawarabayashi and Sideropoulos further improved it to roughly square root n approximation. So what I'm going to talk about today is what looks like just a small improvement. So the approximation factor becomes square root n, like n to the 0.5 minus epsilon for some small epsilon. But I believe that there is more to this result because it sort of provides a pathway towards getting much better approximation. And in fact, I have ongoing work with my student Zian Tan in which we are trying to get subpolynomial approximation algorithms using this pathway. And I'm uh, cautiously optimistic that it's going to work. And if it does work, this is the approximation factor that we would be getting. So it's still pretty large, but it's not polynomial anymore. So I said that we get a pathway towards better approximation. So let me tell you what I mean by that. So if we look at all of these previous positive results, we can view them as if they're using the same framework. And one can show that this framework cannot be pushed beyond square root and approximation. So with this algorithm of Kaurabiyash and Sidropoulos, you basically reach the limit of this framework. And what we do, we introduce a new framework and we show that it does provably better. It can break through this barrier. And in fact, we don't know of any limitations of this new framework. And so in this way, we get pathway for further progress. So now I said that all these algorithms use the same framework. Let me now tell you what it is. And it uses the notion of planarizing edge set that we're going to use a lot. So let's say that this is a graph and this is a subset of its, uh, subset of its edges. So it's a planarizing edge set. If after I delete these edges from the graph like this, I get a planar graph. So this red set of edges is a planarizing edge set and you can have several planarizing edge sets in your graph. And it's not hard to see that there is always a planarizing edge set whose cardinality is at most the crossing number of the graph. So why? Because I can take the optimal drawing of the graph and then I'm going to take one edge per crossing into my planarizing set and that's how I get this planarizing set. So a remarkable work of Kaurabiyashi and Sideropoulos gave a log squared and approximation algorithm for the problem of finding smallest planarizing edge set in the graph. So if we put these two together, what we get is efficient algorithm that given any graphs, graph finds a planarizing edge set in this graph. And the number of edges in that set is at most the crossing number of j times log squared n. So this is really useful. We're going to use this result a lot. And it's actually close to the best you can get because in some graphs, the planarizing edge set has to contain as many as the crossing number of this graph edges. So now we are ready to talk about this old framework for solving the problem. So it consists of three steps. In the first step, we compute a planarizing edge set E prime for the input graph G. And now G minus E prime is a planar graph so I can efficiently find its drawing in the plane. And lastly, I'm going to add the edges of E prime back to this drawing. So this high level framework, as far as I know, was used in every previous algorithm with theoretical guarantees. And in fact, this is also what is done in practice. This is used as a heuristic. So now let's look at this into, in more detail. So first of all, go, let's go to the first step. We need to compute a planarizing edge set for input graph G. So we already discussed this. We can use the algorithm of Kaurabayashi and Sideropoulos to get this planarizing edge set whose cardinality is close to the crossing number of the graph. And this is again, close to the best you can hope for. So in a sense, this first step is done. We don't need to worry about that. Now, what about the second step? You need to compute a planar drawing of G minus E prime. Well, it's a planar graph. So of course you can compute this drawing. The problem is that there could be several such drawings. And if this graph is not three connected, you can get vastly different planet drawings of this graph. 
And the thing is that if we're not careful and we don't choose a good drawing, you may end up paying a lot in the third step when you insert the edges back. So I'm going to put a question mark here just to indicate it's not completely clear how to do this. And now the third step, we need to insert the edges of E prime into the drawing. Again, there could be many possible ways to do this. So I'm going to just put a question mark there also. It's not completely clear how to do this. So in fact, what is described here is not one algorithm, it's a framework or a family of algorithms, and you can sort of implement this framework in different ways. So the big question is, can we implement step two and three in such a way that we get a good drawing of G? So by the way, so throughout this talk, I sometimes for brevity say near optimal drawing. So when I say near optimal drawing, I mean that the number of crossings in this drawing is close to the best possible to the crossing number of G. I'm not saying that the drawing looks in any way like the optimal, it's just about the number of crossings. So going back to this question, actually, uh, we know the answer to this question and the answer is kind of. So you can implement these two steps to get a drawing in which the number of crossings is up squared. And in fact, from here, you can get the squared and approximation algorithm. And this is how the Kawarabayashi zero plus algorithm works. But we also know that you cannot do any better, that this bound is tight. And how do we know it? There are some graphs for which, if we go through this framework, we'll end up with a drawing that has up squared crossings. So now I want to tell you, actually, to show you one such graph, because it's a really nice example and it's easy to see. So this is based on joint work with Vivek Madan and Sipida Mabadi. So I'm going to build this graph gradually. First, I'm going to start with a simple graph. And now I'm going to add four sets of edges to it. And each set will have k edges. So first, I'm going to add these k green edges. Then I'm going to add these k blue edges. Then I'm going to add these k purple edges. So at this point, we have k crosses like this. And this drawing, it has two k crossings. And the last set that I'm adding is this set of k red edges. And this is the whole graph. So this drawing of this graph, it has 2K crossings. So we know that the crossing number of this graph is at most 2K. Now I want to run this framework, algorithmic framework on this graph. So I need to start with some planarizing edge set. And I'm going to start with a set of red edges as my planarizing set. And how do I know that it's a planarizing set? Well, if I take them out, I claim that this is a planar graph because I can draw it like this in a planar way. And in fact, this is the only way to draw this graph in a planar way, because if we suppress all degree two vertices, what we get is a three connected graph and it only has one planar drawing. So we don't really have a choice. It's not like we choose a bad drawing. There is only one way to draw it in a planar way. Okay, and now we need to add the red edges back into this drawing. So how can we do this? Well, for example, we can add them inside like this, or we can add some of them inside, some of them outside. But no matter what we do, we end up with k squared crossings, which is opt squared. Opt is again the crossing number of g. So bottom line, if we use this graph and we apply that framework on it, and the initial planarizing edge set is the red edges, we will end up with opt squared crossings. So to summarize this framework, we can implement it to efficiently produce drawings with opt squared crossings. And this is how one gets squared an approximation algorithm. But this is it. You cannot push it any further. This is the limit of this framework. And if we want to do something better, we need to try something different. So what we do is we introduce a new framework for solving the problem. And it really looks like just a little tweak of the old framework. So let's see. So the first step is the same as before. I'm computing a planarizing edge set E prime for the input graph G. But then what I'm going to do, I'm going to allow myself to augment it. So I'm going to add edges to it until I get a bigger set E double prime. And we require that this E double prime is not too big compared to E prime and the crossing number. And it has some useful properties that I'm not going to go into right now, but we'll see later. And then we continue exactly as before. So now I'm using E double prime instead of E prime. So I'm going to find a planar drawing of G minus E double prime. And then I'm going to insert the edges of E double prime to this drawing. So this really looks like just a small tweak of the original framework. And the question is, does it help at all? And we show that it actually does, at least in the sense that the old barrier does not hold anymore here. And this is shown in this main theorem, which is quite technical, but uh, but this is basically at the heart of this whole work. 
So here's what the theorem says. It's an efficient algorithm. The input is a graph G and initial planarizing edge set E prime. And it allows us to compute this bigger planarizing set E double prime that has these properties. So first of all, as we said already, its cardinality is not very big. Is at most E prime times the crossing number of G uh, times some, uh, plus the crossing number of G times some polylog N. An additional property is that there is a drawing of G in which the number of crossings is not very big compared to E prime and the crossing number of G. And in that drawing, the only edges that participate in crossings are the edges of E double prime. So this is a pretty technical theorem. So I'm going to try and put it into perspective by reminding that we already have this algorithm, good algorithm for computing initial planarizing edge set E prime, whose cardinality is comparable to the crossing number of G. So what can I can do? I can sort of plug in this uh, initial planarizing edge set into this theorem and see what happens. And this is the main corollary that we get is that there is efficient algorithm that given a graph G computes a planarizing edge set E double prime. Now the cardinality of E double prime is comparable to the crossing number of G. And we're also guaranteed that there is a drawing of G in which the number of crossings is quite close to the crossing number of G. And the only edges that participate in crossings are edges of the set E double prime. So if we compare this to what we had with the old framework, in the old framework, we only had opt squared crossings. And now the number of crossings is much, much better. It's almost linear in the crossing number of G. But on the negative side, the old framework, it was algorithmic. So it gave us efficient algorithm to compute a drawing of G with these properties. And right now we just say, well, such a drawing exists, but I'm not telling you how to find it. So going back to this framework, so the first step we can do exactly as before. And this main technical theorem, you can think of it as giving us efficient uh, implementation of step two with a guarantee that there exists implementation of step three and four in which we get a drawing of G that's very, very good close to optimal. And if we only knew how to implement step three and four efficiently, we'd be getting polylogan approximation, which is a really good approximation. So the question remains, how can we implement steps three and four efficiently? And it's okay if we don't do it exactly. So instead of getting the best possible, we get approximate, but we need to do this. So we sort of show how to do this, not all the way, but sort of, and we do it through reduction to a new problem, uh, not new in the sense new, new in the sense for this presentation. And the new problem is called crossing number of the rotation system that seems to be an easier problem. And so now it is enough to get a good algorithm for this new problem. And you can view this reduction and this approximation algorithm together as implementing step three and four of this new framework. So let me quickly uh, tell you what is this new problem cross your number of rotation system. So the input as before is a graph G, but now additionally for every vertex V, I'm given a circular ordering of its incident edges. So for example, if this is my vertex V and it has some incident edges, I'm given ordering E1, E2, E3, E4. And if I take all these orderings across all of the vertices, it's called rotation system for the graph. And now the goal is as before to compute a drawing of G in the plane with fewest crossings as before, but now this drawing has to respect the rotation system. So what does it mean? It's exactly what you would think intuitively. So if this is, for example, a drawing of G, and I look at this vertex V, and I look at this tiny circle around V, and I expand it, zoom into it, and see what's going on there, then the order in which the images of these edges that are incident to V enter vertex V inside the circle, it has to be exactly the same as the input ordering. And it's OK to flip it, so this is fine. We view them as identical orderings, but different orientations. So you can choose your orientation, but the ordering has to be the same. So this is the problem. And the question is, well, is it easier or harder than the original problem? Well, on the positive side, we know the orderings of edges incident to every vertex as they enter them. And that feels like a lot of really useful information. But on the negative side, the vertex degrees are no longer bounded. And what do I mean by that? So remember, we start from a crossing number problem and we do this reduction. So even if in the instance of crossing number problem, all vertex degrees are very small, you can get an instance of this problem in which vertex degrees can be arbitrary. We cannot control them. 
So at this point, it's not clear if it's an easier or a harder problem, but we have one more big advantage in that we can get away with a much weaker approximation. So let me tell you what that means. So how would a standard factor alpha approximation algorithm for the problem look like? It has to return a solution whose cost or number of crossings is at most alpha times the optimal solution uh, value for this new problem, crossing number of rotation system. So instead, I'm going to use a weaker notion of approximation. I'm going to call it factor alpha pseudo approximation. And now you can return a solution in which the number of crossings is at most alpha times the optimal solution value plus the number of edges in the graph. So this actually is very helpful because when the optimal solution value is really small, we can now afford to return a solution that has many crossings. It, it just needs to be comparable to the number of edges in the graph. So this gives us some breathing room when the optimal solution value is small. So it looks easier to achieve than actual approximation. And so we show a reduction that tells that if you can get a factor alpha pseudo approximation algorithm for crossing number of rotation system, you will get a roughly factor alpha approximation algorithm for crossing number problem. So the delta here is as before the maximum vertex degree in the instance of crossing number, not of the new problem. And lastly, we do give some algorithm for this new problem crossing number resolution system. The number of crossing that it produces is pretty large, so it's not even pseudo approximation, but this was enough together with the reduction to get this better than squared n approximation algorithm. And let me mention again ongoing work with Yan Tan, my student that I already mentioned. So we're trying to get efficient factor alpha pseudo approximation algorithm for this crossing number resolution system, where alpha is a polynomial in n. So if this is successful, then together with this reduction, this will give us a polynomial approximation algorithm for the crossing number problem itself. But this is where we are right now. And so going back to the slide that I already showed, we get just a slight improvement in the approximation, but there is a lot more to the story. And I hope that I convinced you that uh, it's useful beyond this little improvement in the approximation. So and now I'm going to go into a little bit more technical part. So I guess I'm, pause, I'm going to pause here and ask if anybody has any questions. Julia, Samuel, yes. Samuel say, good presentation. Thank you. Please, oh, wait, I'm not, I'm not done. Huh? <laughs> Please, can you give me one or two application of graph drawing in computer science if you have them of hand? Thank you. Oh, so there is actually a really good application in VLSI design. Maybe I'm not sure if actually until recently they were actually doing this. So what happens in VLSI design? I'm not an expert, right? But you have sort of a chip in which you need to sort of place gates, as far as I know, and then you need to connect them with wires. And if these wires cross, it's not good for you. Like you need to do some work there. So you want as few wire crossings as possible. And actually, at some point, I look at some paper in VLSI design where they said, yeah, we need to solve crossing number problem. This is how we solve it. And it was exactly this framework that I described. This is one of them. Uh, but graph visualization in general, if you want to draw a graph in a nice way, it's used all over the place. Like, you need this. These are two that I know. But the thing is, it's really strange, but this problem comes up in so many contexts. And just recently, I was proving hardness of approximation of some routing problem. And the proof went through graph crossing number problem. It's just such a natural problem that it just comes up naturally. Should I continue? Uh, OK, uh, I have There's other one questions. Hi, Julia. Uh, thank you for the exposition of your great work. Do you know if there are any use of the graph crossing problem applied to a shop or flow shop sequencing scheduling model? Oh, you know, I actually don't know. No, I don't know that. Like all I know, it's an important problem. It's studied a lot. I don't know, like, no, I, I just focus on one aspect of this. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, uh, sorry, is there more questions? I just don't see the chat in the setup. No, 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 uh, you have continued, please. Okay, so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to look at this main technical theorem that I sort of stated it already, and I'm just going to give you high level ideas that went into the proof of this theorem. 
So again, what does this theorem tell us? It tells us there is efficient algorithm. The input is graph G and planarizing edge set E prime. It computes a bigger planarizing edge set, a double prime, whose cardinality is still not so big compared to E prime and the crossing number of G. And it has this property that there is a drawing of G in which the number of crossings is at most E prime plus the crossing number of G times polylog N. And the only edges that participate in the crossing are edges of E double prime. Again, it's pretty technical, but this is really at the heart of this whole approach. It basically gives a justification why this approach is better than the old one. So before I go into the proof of this theorem, I'm going to take a little detour to discuss some things like congestion, boundary vertices, and good router families. So congestion, this is a standard graph theoretic notion. So suppose I have a set P of paths in my graph G, and I look at some edge in this graph G, for example, like this. And so congestion that this path calls on this edge E is simply how many paths contains edge E. And in this case is going to be three. So next I want to talk about clusters and boundary vertices. So let's say that this is my graph G. So in the rest of this talk, whenever I say cluster, I just mean a connected subgraph of G. For example, here in red, this can be a cluster C, a connected subgraph of this graph. And now what are boundary vertices of C? So these are all vertices that have a neighbor that sits outside of C. So here the circled vertices are the boundary vertices. Okay, now we need to define a C router. So suppose this is my cluster C and the green vertices are the boundary vertices. What's a C router? So a C router is simply a collection of paths inside this cluster C that connect every boundary vertex to some vertex. So for example, here we have a collection of paths, so they're color coded. The red uh, boundary vertex has red paths, green boundary vertex has green paths and so on. And these paths, they connect every boundary vertex to the same vertex, vertex X. And this vertex X, we call it router center. And you can choose it to be anything you want. But all of these paths, they have to go from boundary vertices to that one vertex that you chose. So now if I look at this C router, for example, if I look at these two edges here, then these two edges, they have congestion too. So each one of them is used by two paths. And in fact, the C router may cause pretty high congestion on some edges, and this may be unavoidable. For example, if you have K boundary vertices and every vertex degree is pretty low, let's say four, then some edge will get really high congestion like omega of K, and that's not good for us. We don't want that. So to get around this issue, what we're going to do, instead of using just one C router, I'm going to use a family of C routers. And eventually I'm going to choose one of these C routers at random from this family. So it can still be the case that some edge incurs very high congestion, many of these paths go through it. But on average for every edge, the expected congestion over the choice of this random router is going to be quite small. That's what I'm hoping for. So this brings me to a notion of a good family of C routers. So it's just a collection of C routers. And as I said, I'm going to choose one of these C routers at random. And what I'm asking here is a little bit stronger than what I said before. So I'm asking that for every edge of this cluster C, the expected condition squared is quite small. So small here is log to the fourth n, but it can be any polylog again, it won't matter much. So this finishes the detour. And before I go into the proof of the theorem, I want to present the main tool that's used there. It's called cluster disengagement. And it's actually used in many of these recent works on the graph crossing number problem. So let me tell you what it is. So suppose you have a graph G and then you have some cluster which is connected to a graph of G. For example, this blue one here. And suppose this cluster has these three properties. So first it has a family of a good family of C routers. Second, it is three connected. And the third property, we call it strong planarity. So it has to be planar. Now, if it's planar and three connected, it has only one planar drawing. And in that planar drawing, we're asking that the boundary vertices of the cluster appear on the boundary of the outer face of the drawing. So in this picture, the green vertices are the boundary vertices and this cluster, it has the strong planarity property. So the claim is this. So suppose you have a cluster that has these three properties, then there is a near optimal drawing of G in which the edges of this cluster don't participate in any crossings. 
So again, near optimal just means that the number of crossings is comparable to the crossing number of G. And when we say that edges of C don't participate in any crossings, so in a sense, it means that C is sort of drawn separately from the rest of a graph. And in this unique planar way, this is how C is drawn. So let me now tell you at the high level how you prove this. So suppose this is my graph G, and here in red is this cluster C, and I'm assuming that it has these properties that we mentioned before. So now I'm going to go and look at the optimal drawing of G. And this optimal drawing, it can look pretty crazy. So here in red is the cluster C, in blue is the rest of the vertices and the edges. And as you can see, the red edges here, they participate in crossings, and that's not good for us. We don't want it. So what you want to do, we want to fix this drawing by sort of extracting this cluster C out so that the edges of C don't participate in crossings anymore. And as we do so, we want to make sure that the number of crossings does not grow by too much. So how can I do this? So let me look again at this cluster C and circled here are the boundary vertices. And remember that C has a good family of C routers. So as I said before, I'm going to select one C router at random from this family F, and maybe this is the C router that I selected. So again, a bunch of paths connecting every boundary vertex to this one vertex X that we call the center of the router. So now let's go back to this optimal drawing OG and start fixing it. So first of all, I want to find this vertex X, this vertex that was here. Where was its image here? So its image is this circled vertex. Next, I'm going to delete all vertices and edges that belong to the cluster C, the red ones, from this drawing, like this. Now I'm going to sort of expand or zoom into the circle around vertex X like this. And I'm going to place the planar drawing of the cluster C inside like this. So what I did so far is really great because now the edges of C don't participate in any crossings. However, we have edges that connect blue vertices to red vertices. And these edges, we need to fix them. We need to make sure that they now connect right vertices to right vertices. So for example, if we look at these two green vertices A and B, there is an edge between them. And if we look at the original location of vertex A, it used to be here in this red circle. So this edge AB that you see here, it was the original image of this edge AB. But now A no longer sits here, it sits inside this purple circle. So I need to extend the image of this edge so that it goes all the way to where now the image of A is. And if I do this, I'm worried that I may create a lot of crossings. So how can we do this without creating a lot of crossings? So we go back to this uh, router that we chose at random. And vertex A is located here in the bottom corner. And this router, it contains a path that we call Q that connects A to X. So remember this path Q, it's contained in the cluster C. So going back to this drawing, I'm going to ask, where was the image of this path Q before? So remember path Q, it connected the original location of A to original location of X. So in the original drawing of G, where was this path Q? And maybe this green path is the image of this path Q. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to extend the drawing of the edge AB by going through this image of this green path like this. And so we need to do this for every edge connecting a blue vertex to a red vertex. And as we do this, we may introduce new crossings. But we can show that the expected number of new crossings is small. And it's actually even small compared to the number of crossings in which the edges of C used to participate. And you can prove it by using the properties of good family of C routers. In fact, this is why we define this family in the way we defined it. So going back, this is the claim for the cluster disengagement. And it is not hard to see that you can extend it to many clusters. So now this is a multi-cluster disengagement. So now we are given a bunch of disjoint clusters, C1 through CR. And we assume that each one of these clusters has the same three properties as before. Good family of routers, three connectivity, and strong planarity. And the claim is that still there is a near optimal drawing of G in which the only edges, uh, in which the edges of the clusters don't participate in any crossings. So if we look at this near optimal drawing of G, each one of these clusters is sort of drawn separately in a planar way. 
And the only edges that participate in crossings are edges that don't sit in these clusters. So now we are ready to go back to the proof of this theorem. And here is now how we could prove it, what's the plan. So we start with initial planarizing edge set E prime. And we want to start adding edges to it to augment it to get another edge set E double prime. And as we do this, we watch the connected components of G minus E double prime, and we think of them as clusters. And suppose we can do this so we can build this E double prime so that each one of these clusters has these three properties that we wanted before. So good family of routers, three connectivity and strong planarity. Suppose we can do that. And suppose also we can ensure that this E double prime is small. Then if we can do all this, then we are done. Because multi-cluster disengagement tells us that there is a near optimal drawing of G in which only the edges of E double prime may participate in crossings. <coughs> So this was the proof plan. Unfortunately, the reality turned out to be more complicated. So what we ended up doing is we had to weaken these three conditions, prove that this disengagement still works with these weaker and they're like less nice conditions. And in the end, we just carried out the plan with these weakened conditions. So this is the main technical theorem and these are the main ideas that went into the proof. So let me now summarize. So we showed a new algorithmic framework for graph crossing number, and we show that it doesn't have the same barrier as the old framework. So this gives hope for getting better algorithms. And we also showed sort of proof of concept that indeed with this new framework, you can break through this old barrier of square root n and get a better approximation. And we show reduction to this crossing number with rotation system. And so now it's enough to get good algorithms for this new problem, which seems to be easier. And finally, I want to mention some open questions. And obviously, there is a big open question of getting better algorithms for the crossing number problem. And a good direction now, a promising direction, is crossing number as rotation system if we can get better algorithms for this problem. So also, as I mentioned already, we almost don't have any negative results for crossing number problem. So for example, whether or not you can get factor two approximation is still open. So getting some negative results would be really great. And lastly, all of these algorithms were for one maximum vertex degree is small. If maximum vertex degree is unbounded, we actually don't have anything at all. No better negative results and no, no positive results. So this is it. Uh, thank you. And let me know if there are more questions.